I'm going to get to it because I know everyone's excited about this. I want to um, introduce um, Dr. Fatima Cody Stamford um, and Dr. Margaret Nactigal. Dr. Fatima Cody Stamford um, is an associate professor of medicine and pediatrics um, and practices at teaches at Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Um, she is one of the first fellowship trained obesity, obesity medicine physicians worldwide. She has over 170 peer reviewed publications and is one of the most highly cited obesity, and obesity medicine physician scientists. And we are so grateful to have her here today. And it really would be impossible to enumerate her degrees and awards. Suffice it to say, she's already widely recognized for transforming the field of obesity medicine. Um, as the host, we have Dr. Margaret Nactigal, who is a friend of Let's Talk Menopause. Um, she's been on here before, and we love her. Um, she's a board certified OBGYN and reproductive endocrinologist and research in menopause, hormone therapy, ovarian, um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and infertility. She has an active clinical practice and is a clinical associate professor in OBGYN at New York University Medical Center, where she has numer numerous um, leadership roles. And she's a founding menopause of the North American Menopause Society and speaks and publishes extensively. So I'm going to take it away for you guys. Oh, Margaret, you're muted. You'd think that I would learn this after three years, um, but I'm so excited. Thank you, Donna. So, so excited to be here and really excited to be speaking with Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford. So I'm going to start. We're going to go through questions. We're going to have a conversation and I'm going to be reading your questions that you ask so that hopefully your questions can get answered as well. Um, I'm going to begin with a letter that was written to us from one of the participants who registered for to listen to this. And I think her letter really sums up what so many women go through after menopause. So I'm going to begin from her. It says, help, my entire life, my entire adult life, my weight never fluctuated more than five pounds from 110 to 115 pounds. I was able to wear the same size clothes as I did in high school. I was athletic and had a great body. But then when I turned 42, I had to have a complete hysterectomy, removing my uterus and my ovaries for medical purpose. Within a year, I grew a full size in clothing. I exercised regularly, ate lots of salads, severely minimizing my intake of bread and pasta, but nothing worked. I kept gaining weight. Now I weigh 165 pounds and it's difficult for me to even look in the mirror. All I get from the nutritionists and doctors that I've seen is eat more protein, eat less, eat, less, eat less carbohydrates, the whole speech, but nothing more. Please help me. Please help me find a way to lose this weight. And I think that this is a perfect way to begin because I hear this all the time with my menopausal patients. They gain weight after menopause with a lack of estrogen. Could you tell us what's going on here? Absolutely. First of all, I feel her pain. Um, I don't know who you are. Um, thanks for sending that in, but I think this is um, a really important issue. And, and I want to start with saying that the number one person that would seek my care in obesity medicine is a peri or postmenopausal woman. That is the number one person seeking care for the treatment of excess weight in the United States and around the world. So I want to add that piece of the puzzle. So it's not just a US-based issue. So let's talk about what happens when we make that menopausal transition. So prior to menopause, we have high levels of estradiol or estrogen on board. Obviously that begins to decline and then completely comes down. We go from having what we call a gynoid distribution of weight Gynoid means we carry that weight in our hip, buttock, and thigh region. That's healthy weight. It's that junk in the trunk. It's the, the apple bottom. It's all the things that you might hear in popular music, or maybe that pop music is not so popular. I think those are all like 20 <laughs> years old now. Um, and you go to having an Android distribution of weight. Android means male-like. Now, there's also Android phones, so maybe you want to change to an Apple phone. But uh, um, Android means male-like distribution. And what does that mean? We have that migration of that fat from the hip, buttock, and thigh region to the central region, which is that midsection. And that's what we don't want, right? These are the people that may have been lean their whole lives. They do all of this exercising. They eat healthy, do, do all of the right things. They check all the boxes. And they're like, but wait a minute. I'm checking all the boxes. This is what this woman stated. She increased her intensity, but something has happened. So she had um, basically surgical menopause, right? She had full removal 
of her uterus and her ovaries. She, this immediately placed her into to menopause, average age for menopause right in the US, about 51. She's 42. She goes from being between 105, or I think she's 105 to 115, all the way up to 160. So this is a 50 plus pound weight gain significant shift in what she feels about herself, her value, her worth, because according to her, she's doing all the right things. So let's first of all define that this is not her fault. Right. The only fault that she has is being a human who's a woman. Right. If you're human and you're a woman, if you're alien, I don't know what to do. I'm not, I don't do sci-fi either, so I don't know much about that. But if you're a human woman, this is par for the course. Now, does it mean that every single human woman will have the same experience. Last time I checked that all human women were different. Even right. looking at the screen today, as you look at Dr. Noctgall and myself, we have things that look different about us, but even inside there are things that are working differently and we don't respond to different hormonal shifts the same way. It just is what it is. And so when one paid person tells you, and this is what I absolutely despise on social media, well, I was able to do X, right. Y, and Z by doing this. You are you and great for you. Right. But that doesn't define every human's experience. This woman has given us clear information. She's done these things. She's given us her regimen. It sounds like her regimen is very healthy, quite intense even. Right. Probably even too restrictive. But even despite all of her best efforts, her body has shifted. And hence, she's a human woman that has gone into menopause, surgically induced, and her body responded with a major shift in adipose, which I presume is probably more central than not in that midsection. And she is frustrated and she needs our help. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's, that's the key thing is it's that lack of estrogen, which we know that estrogen was keeping that shape and now it's not. And, and we know that estrogen is an insulin sensitizer. So these these women are now relatively, as opposed to before, insulin resistant. And so that increase weight and that distribution is causing this, this difficulty. So two questions immediately come okay. into my mind. One is, should she have gone on estrogen? Would hormone therapy have been an answer for her? Is it something that people should, do you, know, do you recommend it at that time for that purpose? Mm -hmm. And then two, what, let's talk about the other things that we can do. And also the other things that could potentially be causing that increase other than just the loss of estrogen. Yes. So let's first talk about estrogen um, replacement therapy. We know after the WHI, the Women's Health Initiative, there was a major shift in the use of hormone replacement therapy, right? This was in the, the late 90s, early 2000s. I was actually working at the CDC when this whole fiasco was going on. I was working in the Office of Women's Health of all places. And so let me tell you, a lot was going on mm -hmm. then. Um, but let's let's fast forward over to 2023, where we are now. Um, if you look at the data, I would not say that the first line thing um, would have been per se estrogen replacement. However, if the patient started to have peri or postmenopausal symptoms, um, estrogen replacement therapy would have been deemed feasible. Now, would that in and of itself have prevented this degree of weight gain? It's hard to say, which we'll get into, I guess, your second question. Um, what else could be done in this situation? And I think we, uh, particularly in the work that I do in obesity medicine, have to think about the full range of modalities of treatment. So um, it appears from listening to her, and you could go even deeper if you really want to look at her macros right. and all these types of things right. that she's optimized her lifestyle. And so at this point, the use of an anti-obesity medication might be something very feasible. And this is often what I do for patients that are coming in. Um, and if you look at every trial that's been performed on every anti-obesity medication, the number one participant is a postmenopausal white woman. That is who are in the study. So these are not the studies where you're looking at, oh, are there enough women in the studies? Oh, 80%. 80, 85% will be postmenopausal white women now. People that look like me, that's a different story. We'll get that. That'll be another conversation for another day. Um, but so these, these medications that are, are now becoming more accessible and available in the United States have been mostly tested in this cohort of individuals. So I feel comfortable knowing, hey, we have adequate individuals that have been tested with these medications. 
um, let's potentially try one of these, recognizing that if this individual is a responder, this will be a lifelong use of whatever that agent is. So making sure that people recognize that when we're treating excess adiposity, excess fat, excess weight, that there is biology tied into that. And if we are causing a shift in that biology by using a medication, for example, the medication only works while it's being used, much like if you were using estrogen, going back to your that initial question, right? If we right. could use estrogen, that treatment of symptoms or associated symptoms associated with menopause, it only work while you're using it. It isn't just like right. work indefinitely, like it didn't just right. like right. stay in the system. So those are my, those are kind of like two kind of overarching thoughts um, for someone that had w more severe disease, you know, I might consider surgical intervention um, in the form of metabolic bariatric surgery. That is a very common um, situ scenario um, for patients, obviously a little bit less common than my patients that I would use pharmacotherapy. This patient doesn't obviously meet that level of, of severity, but she this right. is disabling to her. Well, I think that's the issue, just as you mentioned before, that individualizing the exactly. approach and the evaluation and the workup, right. you know, is so critical. And that's why you know, it's, it's really important. I think that, you know, we talked about, she was optimizing her diet and her exercise. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I know she was probably, you know, trying to reduce her stress, but just by being in that situation, I find that people are increasing their stress, which can Absolutely. also, um, have a negative effect. And, and let me, let me, let me touch on that point. Cause I think that yeah. point is super important. So when we have an increase in stress, her stress associated with like, look, I'm doing all this stuff. I'm doing all this stuff. Stress, when stress goes up, what else goes up? Storage of adipose or fat. So even the stress about her situation is often causing more stress. So when I have patients that are coming in that are doing what I'm going to call too much, they're doing this and this and this and this, and they're stressed about it. And I'm like, look, calm down. I mean, you're stressing me out just listening to you. That is going to cause you to store more. And if you're wondering why there's so much resistance, the degree of stress that's coming through the screen right now, if I'm doing telemedicine or in this room, <laughs> I need it to come down. And I'm I'm a, I'm someone that works on all cylinders at all times. So for me to say that, <laughs> that is something. Mm -hmm. So that's important to note. So I, I just wanted to, to acknowledge that. Um, and just your statement is super right. important. And it, it um, in the q and I see that the person who wrote that, that we use, mm -hmm. said that she was actually put on hormone therapy. And I think that's, you know, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, are there any things medically that we should be thinking about that we didn't think about for someone like this that maybe was on hormone therapy? Maybe typically I, you know, like to talk about hormone therapy. And I think yeah. that estrogen can do a really good job sometimes of preventing this, yes. this, this dangerous type of, you know, adipose tissue right. that, right. that occurs in the middle. Um, and maybe we can talk about that after, but first are, are there other medical issues or other medications that might be causing this weight gain? Absolutely. First, I'm so glad you got, it. let's go to this, the second part first. Cause that's a, you saw it like my eyes got excited, just like <laughs> really excited about that. We know that 20% of obesity in the United States is caused by medications prescribed for other conditions, medications like lithium, Depakote, Tegretol, Celexa, Cymbalta, Effexor, Paxil, Prozac, Ambien, Trazodone, Lunesta, Gabapentin, Glabarite, Glipsite, Lamepirite, Metoprolol, Propanolol, Atenolol, Long-Term Insulin, Long-Term Prednisone, just to name the ones that I felt like- yeah, I wanna do that. Breath, right? Those are just some of the medicines. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of medications that if you really listen to, oh, you guys, if medicine doesn't work out, I'm just gonna do that announcing from the pharmaceutical companies on TV. Perfect. Yes, this may cause, blah, 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 blah. I think I can get that job. What do you guys think? So- I, You got um, it. <laughs> but no, seriously, if you listen to those um, those ads, they will often hear, you'll hear weight gain often in many mm -hmm. of these ads. Now, one of the things they did not teach us in medical school, well, they didn't teach us about excess weight. They didn't teach us right, about they, didn't, no. they taught us nothing. They didn't teach us even really about lifestyle. Like all of what I learned, I learned from popular magazines, self glamour, those types of things. I mean, I did a three year fellowship in obesity and nutrition. So I don't worry, you guys, I you got some solid, solid <laughs> now. But we didn't learn those things. Those things mm -hmm. weren't taught on our um, for our US medical licensing exam. They weren't um, emphasized on our individual boards, whether you're OBGYN, internal medicine, pediatric, this stuff just was not taught. So you had to kind of figure this stuff out. But what I have learned in doing this work and doing my three-year fellowship here in, in obesity, medicine, nutrition is that 
a lot of our medications that we do prescribe for other issues do cause weight gain. So one of the things I do on an initial assessment um, is I look at like, hey, what, is, what are they on? And I may often mm -hmm. find, particularly in women um, that are in the menopausal age range, that they may be on four, five, seven, ten medications that are what we call weight promoting medications. These are not now. So then people are like, well, I'm on such and such and I didn't gain weight. Right. Do not use Same your thing. story to extrapolate to the whole human female menopausal group, which is millions right. and millions and millions of people. Right. So these are weight promoting medicines, meaning they have the potential to promote weight gain. Some people are very sensitive to mm -hmm. even the smallest amounts. So let's look at something that is often used, an herbal uh, supplement that you often will hear about being used, um, black cohosh. And I don't know if I never know if I'm saying that correct. For most people, they'll be like, oh, you know, I'm not noticing any weight gain. But you do have patients that I have come in and they're like, oh gosh, I gained all this weight when I, I have to. Right? And but that's not supposed to be a side effect. Like, right. why 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 did that happen to that person? Are they lying? Did they do something different? Maybe they were they were doing something wrong. But you know what I'm noticing now, people that are using like Apple Watches and all these devices which show trends in weight, what I can often do is see that weight increase because they went on something like that. And you can see exactly, mm -hmm. they'll be like, your weight has been up for the last 62 days. And, and they're like, okay, well, what, what happened 62 days ago? You go back, go to their Amazon purchases, and guess what? They purchased X, Y, or Z supplement to help them with what, whatever. So this is why it's also important, you guys, to make sure that you're getting the full medical history, not just the things that are going into our lovely epics or whatever EMI right. you're using, but also what else? The over-the-counter products. Exactly. Right. Well, about exactly. the medications then, you know, sometimes that's such a difficult dilemma because right. if you're on, say, you know, an antidepressant, right. that's treating a very important yeah. component of, of the person, yeah. but the side effect is the weight gain. It's a, it's a tough, it's what a do tough we do? Goal. Do we, do we try to change the antidepressant? Do we, do we try to treat the weight gain? I'm going to give you a fun story. Do do? Don't worry. It's only going to last for two minutes, but it will give you one of the answers to that question. So, um, when I first moved to Boston, I had a diff, uh, hairstylist and you know, when you're getting your hair styled, you're just listening to your, your hairstylist and she, she's talking and she's like, yeah, I've just gained some weight. And so, I'm, you know, I kind of, my ears perk up a bit. Um, I think she strategically is telling me this story because she knows what I do for a living. So I'm like, and I was like, oh, so what, you know, as I'm listening, she's doing my hair. Okay. So what happened? She was like, you know, they put me on this, you know, I got, you know, I've just been, I've been having some depression and I finally have gotten put on some medication. I'm like, okay, well, what did you get placed on? And she was like, oh, they placed me on mirtazapine. I was like, why did they choose that? And she was like, oh, no, that's just what they told me. And I was like, mm, yeah, no, um, I think that's what happened. And she's like, you do? And I was like, well, I mean, I could be wrong, but mm -hmm. let's try this theory. So I said, I wrote down on some random sheet of paper. At the I, the same thing. Mm -hmm. I said, why don't you tell your doctor? And I considered switching over to bupropion. So I said, let's see if you can get shifted to this. And, you know, this, you can tell them to look me up and, you know, say I'm legitimate. I mean, they don't have to do it. So she went, talked to her doctor soon after our visit within the, the, you know, within a few days, got switched from ritazapine to bupropion. I came back to the hair salon. It was, let's say, eight to 12 weeks later. I don't know what the exact time frame was, but it was within two to three months. And she had lost 22 pounds. Now, I personally think she should have done my hair for free. I mean, like, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, just, just throwing that out there. You guys can respond in the Q&A. I can't see it because I can't look at that and talk, but... <laughs> All we did was make that one shift. And here she was 22 pounds lighter from that one shift. So for many of my patients, I can tell you my first line therapy isn't always starting a medication. It may be deleting medication one, mm -hmm. maybe substituting, deleting two, because she never really even needed that. Oh yeah, I've been taking right. that, but I don't really notice anything from that. Um, there are certain medications that are often used in the menopausal period, a common one, gabapentin. Gabapentin, I've seen upwards of 85 pounds of weight gain from gabapentin use, which may sound mind blowing, but not outside of the realm of what I've seen in my practice. And when you plotted her on the graph, you know, her weight graph in, in our center, you could immediately start her initial prescription and see the weight jump. And then she stabilized at this new set point. We titrated her off the medication. I never had to use 
one of my anti-obesity medications. So paying attention to that person, the full story is mm -hmm. super important and recognize it requires a bit more work because it's not a right. cookie cutter approach, but then you're targeting what the patient needs. What do they need? Not like what just assume that everybody needs the same thing. Well, you, you said a word in there, which I actually had intended to ask you about. So this is a perfect time because okay. on your 60 minute, um, which was amazing um, episode that I watched, you talked about the set point and you talked about how when people are dieting, they can get a new set point and then they can get, they stay at that set point. Can you right. tell us about what does a set point mean? How can we make ourselves get a new set point that's 10 pounds below where we are now and you know what can we do yeah so i wish that if i could answer that one i i would stop all work because i would stop <laughs> <laughs> uh, but let's let's go with what set point is so set point is is basically a and it's i would i think it's it should really be technically called set range and so let's let's okay. talk about set point range um and let's look at each individual that's let's listening today let's look at you let's look at me there's probably a a range a relatively tight range that our bodies stay within. It may go up a little bit during the holiday season, November, December, kind of goes up a little bit. And then it kind of in January, February kind of comes down into whatever this range is. For this patient that that came, that wrote in, she said her range, she told us what her set point or range was right. like 110, 110 115. 115. Right? right. So she kind of, she may, maybe she got 117, right. or she was down to right. 109, right. but there's a, there's a relatively narrow range. And if you go and look at individuals, regardless of how much excess weight they they have or whether they're very lean, people tend to be within a range. Now, over our lifetimes, we may notice that range changes, particularly as we get older. So one of the things that this woman stated was that, oh, she had a high school range. People can typically remember whatever that high school range was. Oh, I was around here in high school. And ooh, right before I had kids, if you had children, I was here. Or right before I went through IVF, I was here. Or whatever it is, you know this range. Mm -hmm. um, and right. that range, once you get into that range, your body is going to do what it can. It's going to compensate with different hormonal shifts, whether it's like leptin or ghrelin, peptide YY, anandamides, etc. It's going to do all this adjustment to kind of keep you in this range. Now, let's say you go on a diet, which I hate diets. Diet has the word die in it. I don't know if you guys thought about that, but if you go on a diet, which means you're dying, <laughs> um, and let's just pick something that people did, you know, the grapefruit diet, right? So if you're eating mostly grapefruit, you drop your weight acutely. And let's say you come down 40 pounds. You're feeling really good. You put on a pair of pants you haven't worn in forever because it was back in the closet somewhere, some dress you really wanted to put on. And you look great in some pictures, but over the next several months, that 40 pounds you lost becomes a gain of 50 pounds. And now, so you've technically reset your set point up to 10 plus pounds above where you started. You're like, well, that's not fair. I did all this really restrictive stuff. I don't understand. Why did, why did my body do that? And so it's really very, I would say it's very simple, but let's just see what happens. When we do, when we restrict our bodies, what happens is we also reduce our basal metabolic rate. So our basal metabolic rate drops because it's like, wait a minute, what is Fatima doing? We need to we need to conserve. She's starving us. I mean, not necessarily starving it, but it's outside of its range of what it sees as normal. And so what is it going to do as soon as you stop that? It's going to do it's going to like, OK, wait a minute. We don't want her to do that again. Let's push her up a bit higher because so ooh, we, that was uncomfortable. Your brain has decided it wants to be this place now for some people. Lifestyle modifications can change that point of a small minority of 10% or so, making the shift in exercise, the shift in diet, it can bring them into a new set point, they're able to maintain it. These are the people that go on Instagram, you know, I did this and you should follow my plan because with this is this is how I did it. And if you're not doing it this way, you're doing it the wrong way. Hold your horses because <laughs> that worked for them doesn't mean it will work for you now. For other people, they you know maybe we do use a medication, or for even like my hairstylist. This I, she's mm -hmm. not not my current hairstylist, but if she stayed on bupropion, maybe she would defend that set point. Probably not twenty two pounds down, maybe it's eighteen pounds, and she just maintains that while on the medicine. But while on the medicine is a really key phrase there, because if I were to pull that back from her, her body would probably go to wherever she was prior to all of the introduction of those medications. 
So those are really, really important things to think about when we're thinking about what things can change set point. Metabolic and bariatric surgery obviously can change set point. Mm -hmm. Then people come, well, Dr. Sheffer, I don't think surgery works because my friend gained weight. Okay, all right. So your friend right. gained weight, this other person didn't. But what we do know is those hormones that shift immediately after surgery, what they end up doing is they end up rebounding back to their normal state, those hormones. As the brain goes to still defend itself, what is it going to do? It's going to move you back, which is part of why patients that undergo surgery should still be treated for their chronic disease and obesity, often may even need medications as an adjunct to surgical intervention. So I know I just said a lot. No, <laughs> that was great. It's pretty complex. And, and I do not, want to talk about yeah. the medications. I'm yeah. getting a couple of questions in a yeah. row here about the um, going back to the exercise, cha yeah. the change in exercise and what can we do and what specific types of exercise, recognizing that everybody's a little yeah. bit different, but yeah. knowing that after menopause and with a lack of estrogen, we're getting this right. relative insulin resistance. Um, and they're asking, and obviously we wanna protect our bones because right. we need yes. some weight resistance. Is there a specific type of exercise that is particularly beneficial, that's gonna be helpful in reducing this increase in weight and that specific ad middle adipose, which we know is more dangerous to heart and brain um, uh, other than before menopause? Yeah, so I, I will say that specifically in terms of type of exercise, I tell my patients to pick the exercise that they will do for the rest of their life. I can tell them to go and do the Peloton advanced strength workout that I did this morning, right. but maybe that's not their activity. Right. And so I can go tell them to do that. They can go labor through it, get hurt. Then they have these injuries. Now they're going to see the, the physical therapist. Then they break something, you know, it's the whole disaster. Yeah. Yeah. For example, I always tell people this and, and people know this. I am not a fan of skiing. I am a hugely active individual. You can go look at my Instagram and see that, but I do not like skiing. <laughs> If some doctor were to say to me, hey, you know, Fatima, you know, you should be active. Skiing would be a really great exercise for you. Oh, you know, I know you don't like downhill, go cross country. I would say, screw you because Goodbye. I don't like skiing. <laughs> you're, you're not getting the point. So right. if you were to look at the studies and go into the peer reviewed literature and you're looking at something like fatty liver disease, fatty and, and looking at the systematic reviews and meta-analysis, they would state on average, high intensity interval training would be best specifically for that. For menopausal weight gain, there is not a study that says this type of exercise is the best. What it will say is that we want at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity. You know, we want vigorous activity. If we can get those in, you can reduce your volume if you're doing very vigorous activities. But I say do the activity that you would do. What is your soulmate workout or workouts? Yeah. And I think that's I, so key. That's important. You want to enjoy yourself too. Exactly. And we don't. That's what you'll do forever. Right? Yeah. Right. Right. I think that's, that's, yeah. so that's it's about what's now, I'm do I want people to be doing strength training and, you know, like a mixture of cardio and strength training, um, you know, some vigorous activity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not, not everyone can do that. So what is it that they'll do that they enjoy? If walking is the thing they enjoy, maybe they're walking flat grounds. Maybe they do some inclines, do whatever you like in that. So, domain. And combining yeah. the, the, the weight training with the cardio exactly. in a way that it makes people happy. And so they'll continue and not doing just it, like repulse. So they keep exactly. doing it. I think that's yeah. great advice. Yeah. Well, I know that everyone really wants to hear from you in terms of the medications yes. and definitely in, you know, even in just the last month, I would say yeah. uh, in social media, uh, everywhere, there's so much information um, about the new medications, the GLP-1 receptor agonists for weight loss. But I want to hear about not just those, but the other ones that you would recommend um, for patients or people who have obesity, for people who have type 2 diabetes, but also are there people where these are beneficial, where they don't meet those criteria? So yeah, so let's go into first, the, the first question was like, hey, what's available? Um, so there are several medications available. I agree that there's a lot of uh, media attention on the GLP, um, GLP-1 class of medications. We'll come back to that. I use a full range of medications. Not everyone is a responder. So you may have heard me saying throughout this talk about responders versus non-responders. Just like anything else, every single person doesn't respond. 
we could start talking about the GLP-1 receptor agonists, which are um, either once daily injections or once weekly injections. Um, the GLP-1 receptor agonist, which stands for glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor antagonism, it actually works on two pathways of the brain that tell us how much to eat and how much to store. There's the POMC pathway. The POMC pathway is in a paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus. It's called the proopium melanocortin pathway. Say that five times fast. When you travel down that pathway of the brain, um, it tells your body to eat less and store less, okay? Mm -hmm. And then there's an alternate pathway of the brain, um, particularly in the hypothalamus still, in the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus is called the AGRP pathway or the goody related peptide pathway. That's the pathway that we like a little bit less. It's the one that tells us to eat more and to store more. Now, how do the medications primarily work? By upregulating, you might be like, well, this is, is she in like science class? <laughs> and we are, but um, it's disguised as a webinar, a podcast. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> no, but seriously, it, um, the GLP ones work by upregulating that POM C pathway, that pathway that we desire a bit more, the one that tells us to eat less and store less, and it down regulates the AGRP pathway, the pathway that tells us to eat less and store less. That is the primary mechanism by how these medicines work and why, on average, they are more efficacious than other medications because they're working on some of the primary pathology. Now, they also have a few other things that they do in the body. They slow gastric emptying. So if things move through the GI tract slower, you stay full longer. You'd be like, wait a minute, I haven't eaten in seven hours? Because if it's moving through really slowly, you're still full, right? Like that, that obviously is how it works. It also improves insulin sensitivity. We talked about insulin sensitivity a little bit earlier. Um, and another thing it does that is a lesser known thing that people don't know is it actually browns your white adipose tissue. So fat tissue in our bodies um, on average is white, particularly as we get older, when we're babies, we have a lot more brown adipose tissue, just think my skin color, and then it gets a little bit whiter. When it's brown or in color, it's more beneficial. It helps you to burn more, um, just sitting, resting energy expenditure improves. So this is, there's a lot going on with these medicines. This mm -hmm. is how they work. And this is why on average, if we're looking at semaglutide, which is a once weekly injection, um, we're seeing about 15.5% total body weight loss. And then with the dual agonist that will be likely approved in first or second quarter of this year for obesity, trizepatide, it includes a GLP-1 agonist and also includes a GIP, which is a glucose insulinotropic polypeptide. Say that two times fast. Um, so as for the first dual agonist, on average, we're seeing 22.5% total Which body is huge. Loss. I mean, yeah, that's huge. amazing. Yeah. And we haven't very, very seen that yeah. with other agents. Right. And so for both of these, notice I say it gave you an average. So just think about, right. just go back to college or high school or whatever school you want to go to. Average being average means that they're going to be high responders. Those people that do super well. I mean, right. I have patients that are um, on any of the medicines I'll discuss that may lose 50% of their body weight. Like, whoa, like nothing I just told right. you was anywhere near 50 Right. And then there's some that may lose 1%. Okay, so the one percenters probably don't need to be on that medicine. Right. Not that we don't think that they're valuable humans, but they, that doesn't work with their biology. They need so, something different. <laughs> something different. So let's go over to some of the more traditional medications. The first medication approved here in the United States for the treatment of obesity is fentermine. Now, people hear fentermine, they get scared. They're like, oh gosh, it was the fenfen era. So Fentramine gets a bad rep because it played with a bad kid on the playground, and that bad kid was fenfluramine. Fenfluramine is spelled F-E-N-F-L-U-A-R-M-I-N-E. -E. It was removed from the market because it caused heart valvulopathy. We don't like to cause heart valvulopathy by causing weight loss. Um, now, fentramine was part of that combination, fen, fen. They both happen to sound the same. Fentramine is spelled P-H-E-N-T-E-R-M-I-N-E. -E. Now, fentramine has remained on the market continuously. First medication approved in the U.S. for the treatment of obesity starting in 1959. It has remained continuously on the market since that time. People are like, oh gosh, but they're going to get elevated blood pressure. Go and check the systematic reviews. On average, fentramine does not actually cause elevations in blood pressure or heart rate. Bupropion, however, which I discussed a little bit earlier, does. And so if you talk to the cardiologist, they're going to be fearful of all, but they will be also equally fearful of bupropion. The way to mitigate that, what I do with my patients is just to make you feel better, is I have my patients take their blood pressure and pulse when starting either fentanyl or bupropion Monday morning, Wednesday, midday, Friday evening to check that on a weekly basis for at least the first four to eight weeks, see how they respond with any dose increase, we would do the same. 
And if we see there's no significant shifts, hey, we're feeling pretty good. So fentramine is a, a it's also improved in combination with a drug called topiramate, topiramate or topamax, some people call it dopamax. Um, topiramate and fentramine in combination is approved under the trade name of Qsimia. Um, on average, if you look at the clinical trials, the equipped studies, it will say about 9.4% total body weight loss. I have had patients lose 55% total body mm -hmm. weight loss, hence, I can't say that, oh gosh, that didn't work for that patient. Mm -hmm. That's very, very sizable. Um, and I've presented this in many lectures. If any of you have seen any, I often present patients that are high responders to Fentope um, because people assume, oh, we wouldn't use those meds. But let me tell you, those people, I wouldn't switch them over to a GOP-1 agonist if they've already lost 54% of their total right. body weight. I'm feeling, feeling pretty good um, about their response. Um, there's a combination of medicines called Contrave, bupropion and naltrexone. Bupropion um, being a medication we would use for depression or tobacco cessation, but naltrexone is an opioid antagonist. Um, the Contrave is approved for the chronic treatment of obesity. We're seeing on average 6.5% total body weight loss, so 9.4 with fentramine to a pyramate, 6.5 with bupropion and naltrexone. Um, so those can be used in combinations. Older medications, and not as old as fentramine, but medicines that I think were kind of on an older premise is Orlistat. Um, Orlistat is a pancreatic lipase inhibitor. It works on the idea that people that have obesity must eat a lot of fat, so let's inhibit the fat. <laughs> um, which is why it doesn't work so great. On average, we're seeing about three to 4% total body weight loss, a lot of oily underwear um, and a lot of flatulence, which is just not pleasant um, anywhere. Um, so that's Orlistat. Um, and then of course we have our GLP-1 agonist, liraglutide, which is approved under the trade name of Sixinda. On average, it's a once daily injection. We're looking at somewhere between six and 8% total body weight loss. And then of course, semaglutide at 15.5% average, trizepidide 22.5%. There are other medications that you might see, although these are less used in the stimulant category, diethylpropion, fendimetrazine, for example, are also in that category. Very few studies, so you're gonna see fentramine as the, the key kind of standout within that group. Um, other medications you might hear of, zonisamide, which can be used in lieu of topiramate, um, is also an anti-seizure, anti-epileptic drug. Um, bupropion and zonisamide are often combined so there's quite a, a few things that are out there. There are, I can tell you, having talked to many of the companies that are developing products um, for weight regulation, that there's several that are coming down the pike um, that I did not mention that are in phase two and phase three um, and, and the FDA in terms of investigation. What about, the, um, what about like an, the older um, insulin sensitizer, like metformin? Um, so metformin is, is not an, a true anti-obesity medicine. However, I will tell you this, and this actually happened in a postmenopausal woman. We tried all of the tried and true, right? Like all the stuff that I just gave you those big numbers. Metformin, I can't even really give you numbers. She failed, you know, failed or was not a responder to this, mm -hmm. this, this. I think we got to like, we got to metformin. I was like, there's nothing left. Let's just try metformin. And she's like, okay, 62 pounds later. <laughs> I was like, really? It was metformin all yeah. along? If I had known that, like I obviously go with my, you know, you go, you're like, okay, let me right, get right. my things that. So for some people, they're metformin responders. And for that woman, I mean, she's the one that stands out the most <laughs> to yeah. me because yeah. she literally like just, I mean, she would just either lose nothing or have some significant side effect. And obviously we're not going to keep anything going if, if anything. And she was like, is there anything on? I was like, well, there's, there's metformin, <laughs> but okay, well, let's just try it. And then she came back the first day. I was like, what? She's like, I know, right? I was like, I mean, it was just ma like, it was like she magical. Needed that, she just needed yeah. that insulin sensitizer. There was something, what something needed. about her receptors were just not working well. Um, um, and the only other thing I meant, I forgot to mention um, is something that's not as proved by the FDA as like a non um, prescription drug is called Plenity. Um, there are these capsules that you take 20 to 30 minutes um, prior to a meal with, I think about 20 ounces of water. It ex expands this kind of jelly-like substance in your belly. So when you go to eat, there's already some type of space occupier basically there that moves through your system. And then prior to dinner, you would do the same thing. Um, on those studies, you're seeing about 10% total body weight loss for those that are responders to that medication or non-medication. It does have to be prescribed, which is why it's a 
a medication, but it, um, it, it doesn't, it didn't require the same level of scrutiny because it doesn't act on the pathways of the brain like those other medicines do. Well, it's, it sounds like there's just so many options yeah. for people. And yes. I know from, you know, my experience with my patients is, yeah. you know, once you know your patient, you really have a good sense of what would be best for them. So right. for people that can't come to see you, because I have the feeling that everybody listening right yeah, now, I have no, I'm not to, taking any new patients. I love you all. <laughs> to see you immediately. What would you suggest that they do? Is there somebody, is there a, is there a website that they can Absolutely. go to? Is there a way to find a doctor? Yeah, so right now there are over um, 60, 6,700 physicians approved in obesity medicine in the country. There are less than 100 of us that have done fellowship training. So we're a small minority of that group. Um, but what you can do is go to abom.org. That's the American Board of Obesity Medicine. And in the top right corner, you'll see something that says, find a physician, verify, verify credentials. It is not behind a paywall. So you don't have to pay to get into the site to go and look up who's in your area, because you can type in your city and your state and then find who's in your area that practices obesity medication medicine, if you are interested in specifically this um, domain of medication. So that would be where I would tell you to go to find out more about who's doing this work or who could treat you if you're finding that, oh, you know, I'd love to do this, but my my primary care, whomever I see, just doesn't really have this, this knowledge. Um, there are also some questions on specifics, and, and I know that that's really hard to say. So generally, yeah. um, for people that are listening, what would you say are the like maybe three top things that you think we should all be doing, say, uh, to keep ourselves as healthy as possible, to be non-obese and not have we diabetes. We use the word obese, so we did, we've canceled that. I canceled that in canceled 2016. That. Yeah, that, was, that one's been canceled. Thank so you. I'm sorry to uncancel it. I, I, I <laughs> definitely okay. apologize. Thank you. No worries. No Just worries. To keep ourselves know. healthy, happy. What do you and think? A healthy like, weight. Yeah. <laughs> healthy weight and, and as you know comfortable as possible. Yeah, so I would say number one, um, recognize that if you do begin to struggle with your weight and you're doing you know, all of the right things, it's not your fault. This is your body, you're a human woman, you are hitting menopause, it is not your fault. And I think we place a lot of blame on ourselves. And when we place that blame on ourselves, it increases stress and stress increases storage of more fat and it's just a vicious cycle from there. So number one, this is not your fault. Number two, I mean, we do want to optimize our lifestyle as much as we can look at lean protein, whole grains, fruits and vegetables as our predominant source. Um, I don't, while I am one of those people that sits on like I pick the best diets, which I, I, I kind of <laughs> balk at every year with US News. Um, I think it's about finding the right diet for you, right? There, you know, if someone's a vegan, my sister's a vegan, that's something that works very well within her lifestyle is where she feels her best. I am not vegan, but I don't eat beef. I don't eat pork. I don't eat lamb. I start mm -hmm. sounding a little bit vegan-ish um, mm -hmm. when you get a little bit further down. Um, right. I think I'm a bit more pescatarian-like. But the whole point is, is that that's where I feel comfortable. That's where she feels comfortable. I'm not trying to change her. She's not trying to change me. It's about finding what works for you. Less process is better, obviously. Less, and when I say less, people are like, well, why are you saying any processing? You should right. know that when you put something in the refrigerator, if you, you know, saute it, or you put it in the oven, you are processing it from where its original form is. So I will say that is less processed or minimally processed. It's mm. when things don't look like they look in nature, i.e., um, French fries or things like that. I mean, they taste yummy, but they don't really look like anything in nature. Then you know that we're getting away from, you know, anything that's as it should exist. Um, with regards to activity, like I said, find your soulmate workout and or workouts. I'm a huge high intensity person. I tend to like heavy lifting, high intensity interval training. I like kickboxing. I like plyometrics. I like all those types of things, but that is not everyone's jam. Um, and I don't force that on anyone but that's what I enjoy doing. Since I've enjoyed doing that, that's what I've been doing for over 40 years. That's what, where I thrive. Um, and that's where my body feels happy. It feels unhappy when I'm not doing those things. And so that's what you wanna do. Find your soulmate workout. Try to find ways to mitigate stress. And our stressors will change over time. They may even change from day to day or week to week. What things can you do to be as able to cope i'm trying to say you can't really necessarily get away with this as it's able to cope with your stress as you're able to you know and that changes like i said it changes over time it changes from week to week right. it changes from day to day what things can you do to 
to do that? Is it meditation? Is it is it following this particular religion and, and doing doctrines that are in that domain? Whatever it is for you, it's not to force anything on any one individual. I mean, I start my morning with scriptures. That's one of the first things I do. And then I go from that into my workouts. And so that's this the pattern of what I do where I feel comfortable. When I don't do that, I'm like, something's off. I'm like, oh gosh, I forgot X, Y, or Z, whatever it is. Now, once you've done all of those things and you're like, oh gosh, oh, sleep. How did I forget sleep? Sleep is I'm huge. just about to break. Sleep is huge. I, and mm-hmm. sleep is, is probably one of the things that is most problematic in this peri and postmenopausal course. It's not that you don't want to sleep. You want to sleep, but maybe you're waking up, you're having night sweats, you're having hot flashes, you, you know, your, your brain is like working a thousand miles a minute. You're up four times in the night. You have to go to the bathroom. I mean, just all kinds of stuff is going on. That dysregulation can cause major weight shifts. And so if that's an issue, I would say people more in your domain, Dr. Noctegal, are probably best suited in that domain. But recognize that the traditional sleeping medications, Ambien, Trazodone, mm-hmm. et cetera, do cause weight gain on average for most individuals. And that's so, where it's so tricky. Yeah. And, and it's also... It's so interrelated because the more stress you have, the less you're sleeping. Right. Sleeping, exactly. the more stressed you have. Yeah. And then you throw in the mood changes and how and the basal motor symptoms. And the basal motor systems, and those are waking you up. So it's really hard. I mean, I think, you know, what you said to start that was just to get what's best for you, right? And and try to figure out a way. And I like that you said that what's different for everyone. We heard a lecture last night on our grand rounds, which is typically something about, you know, some new medication or some new, and it was actually about different ways to find wellness. And I found that I so that. interesting that that would Everyone's be different. Topic. And everyone is so different. And talking about how, even if you have so little time that you could find some two minute routine that might provide some wellness for you. And you know, what works for me might not work for you and might not work for someone it's else. It's okay. And it's right. okay. A lot it's of times trying lot to incorporate that and how interesting it is that that all relates mm-hmm. to an increase in weight. And all, how- relates. all of it relates. I mean, sometimes my patients come in very, very anxious and very stressed and this, that, and other. And I'm like, look, I think our first thing we got to work, and I may not even go down a medication or surgical or anything. I'd like, mm-hmm. First, we may have to work on their mental health. Right. I need them to work on their anxiety, just just baseline anxiety. Let's try to get you into a place that you can just sit in this appointment and just be just be there. And, <laughs> um, and, and right, that, that might be part of the major initial step, and then in addition to all yeah. the other things, and, and sometimes and, that's that's even may even be a precursor. Like I, you right. know, they can't get on a regimen or do this or that because all of these things are going on, and I'm like, okay, well, I can't. I want to help you, but I gotta I gotta take it. And so it's a stepwise fashion, right? I don't throw the kitchen sink at everybody on day one. Right. It's like right. about doing a you know like okay, step one. <laughs> this is what we're doing right. for you. And Step now, two, we're going to do this, and it's and it's okay. And some people, you know, maybe they get to this the finish line quicker. This mm-hmm. other person gets to the finish line, and it just take them five years. It's okay, you know. Okay. Everybody's right. on everyone's on their own time stamp. But this is not yeah. a race, actually. Exactly. Um, well, I'm getting a lot of questions um, from people, either they themselves or know someone or are interested in in getting the new newer medications, but finding it so incredibly expensive and their insurance companies are not covering it. And I know I've seen that as well. Um, Any recommendations for them or anything that we can tell them or even just- I want each and every person that is listening right now to advocate to your senators, to your congressmen and women to pass the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act because Mm -hmm. It seeks to do two things. Now, you want to know how many times we've introduced this into Congress. We've done it every year since 2013. We are in 2023. I will remind you guys, we're in January. Some people are still writing 2022 somewhere, but it is 2023, 10 years. Um, Let me tell you what the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act is. seeks to do two things. Number one, under Medicare currently in the United States of America, um, if you want to work with um, an individual that is not a physician, with regards to you, you know, excess weight, maybe you want to work with a dietitian or anyone else, that visit is not covered if you have obesity here in the United States as of January 18th, 2023. You have to get diabetes to get to work with a dietitian to have the visit covered. So let's wait until you get diabetes and now we're going to teach you about diet. Isn't that lovely? 
That mm -hmm. is the current status of affairs in the United States under Medicare. Number two, it is a complete exclusion for anti-obesity medications to be covered under Medicare as of today. What does that mean? Medicare sets the stage for all private insurers and for Medicaid, which is for those that um, are of lower socioeconomic status. If Medicare does not change its rules, individual insurers will be like, well, Medicare doesn't do it. Why should we cover it? Mm -hmm. So we need this bill to pass. Right now on the House side, um, you can imagine that uh, obesity is not a, a partisan issue. <laughs> this is something that affects all of us regardless mm -hmm. of our political leanings. Um, it does have um, sponsorship by both Democrats and Republicans in the House and on the Senate side has over 151 co-signers on the House side last time I checked, but it has not yet crossed the threshold. Um, until that changes, I think you're going to continue to struggle with getting mm -hmm. this, these medications covered because they're going to use Medicare as the example. Now, on your individual state levels, for example, Pennsylvania just, I think maybe about six weeks ago, passed a rule where they will cover state employees now for anti-obesity medicine. So there are small wins you can do at your local levels. Like maybe you live in Florida. I'm just throwing off oh, Florida. <laughs> Go best wishes with that. But maybe you live in Florida mm -hmm. and Florida has a bill mm -hmm. within their state house that you can advocate on in a, on, a, on a local fashion. And it may feel like it's a little local. You know, I'm not hanging out with my people in DC, but those are where the changes can start. And I think that's where, you know, that's where you want to start. Okay, I'm going to do that when we uh, when we finish our conversation. Yeah, but, um, yeah. No, it's very difficult because I think that the cost, you know, on an individual basis, is extremely expensive. Yeah, um, we're talking course, fourteen to sixteen hundred dollars a month for the new medications. Right. And, and and of course, balancing that with the cost of of the weight gain and what that Absolutely. means and and this particular weight gain that is often central mm -hmm. and what kind of risks that is in terms of you know further down the road heart disease and and brain problems and and all of those exactly um so i think i think cost is often a very hard thing to really appreciate yeah um, and i just want to say that these medications are prohibitive the the more um, generic agents that I presented earlier are ones that I can use and, and I'm comfortable using in patients across the age spectrum. Um, they aren't going to be cost prohibitive. Metformin, of course, of all the medicines we listed is the cheapest, which is why I was disappointed in not knowing that medication worked for that one individual. But like I said, for the newer medications, um, the once daily injections on average seven to 800 a month out of pocket, um, the what's weekly injections somewhere between um, 1300 and 1600 a month, depending upon where you're looking. Looking at, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, I'm gonna read you another um, okay. uh, comment here, which is, first of all, a, a couple of people are appreciating the individual appreciate um, uh, attention because some of their doctors haven't done this. And this person um, has been diagnosed with prediabetes. Okay. And mm -hmm. is looking to, to find out, um, having a hard time deciding. And I, and I think the answer is going to be to seek some more medical attention. But um, what per, do you not skip meals? Do you skip meals? Does intermittent fasting have a role? Yeah. What is your. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I've, I've actually um, done some large scale talks on intermittent fasting at like ACP. It was like, I think about 2000 people that came to hear the, come hear this talk. So intermittent fasting has been um, touted as the holy grail. Um, when, when, any, when a statement starts like that, you're gonna learn quickly that it is not necessarily the holy grail. For some people, I would say a small minority of people, they may respond to intermittent fasting. What do I mean by respond? they may have some weight loss. They may have improvement in their metabolic profile with improved um, LDL cholesterol, um, improved triglycerides. They may have um, improved hemoglobin A1Cs, average blood sugars, et cetera. However, for a large majority of individuals, I do not see these changes. And in order for us to really see these be beneficial or meaningful in any way, patients would need to practice an intermittent fasting lifestyle and maintain that for at least five plus years. So <laughs> whenever you're doing something, think, hey, do I want to do this for the rest of my life? If the answer is no, don't start, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so 
if if your body if is responding to intermittent fastings with these changes in this the metabolic profile, if you're getting that benefit and you feel comfortable, it's natural to you. It feels like you can do this forever. Then go for it. I do have a few patients that fit that. I have one patient who's a surgeon here at MGH, um, and he absolutely loves intermittent fasting. It fits with his lifestyle. He has to go around in the hospital somewhere between four thirty and five. He has the operating room starting around 7.30 in the morning, 7, 7.30. He doesn't get a chance to even come out of the OR until at least 2 o'clock p.m. Then he finally gets to eat, but he doesn't have pressure to think, oh, gosh, I can try to find something in between the case. He just waits, and then it's very natural with his lifestyle. So he's been maintaining this now for about five or six years, and he feels comfortable. It feels good to him. His metabolic profile looks great. But notice I'm able to point to this individual, um, very few individual, and I have a patient panel of over 2,000 patients, um, probably two additional patients beyond that person I just mentioned that are able to um, use intermittent fasting long term and have you know measurable results. Well, we we are we only have one minute left, okay. so um, but there are a couple of other questions just here on. Um, you know, long-term effects of these lifelong plans. But I think, you know, you really summarized everything well by, by finding what's best for the particular individual. And I think that is so, so critical and what I'm gonna do moving forward with, with helping um, my patients. So we're gonna wrap that up, Donna. I think you're here to, to give us some things, but thank you so much for talking with me. I love talking to you. I can't, I, I wanna talk to you all day because I have 10,000 <laughs> questions for you, but we'll have to do that after this webinar for our next webinar. So Donna, I'm giving it back over yeah, to you. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I just wanted to say the same thing. Thank you so much to both of you, Dr. Margaret Nactagal from NYU, uh, menopause specialist, um, and Dr. Fatima Cody, Stanford.